I have no idea what the opening chapter title means. I was thinking about that uh, earlier today. Belly of the whale part I can understand, you know, Jonah and the whale and all that kind of stuff, but the monkey's teeth? Uh, I'm not real clear about that. <clears throat> George never spent any time wondering why he wanted to be long. Sound like anybody else we've read about? Uh, <laughs> well, okay, kind of everybody else. Uh, Meg definitely. Charles Wallace definitely. Taryn does. It's not that he wants to belong. He wants to stand out. He wants to stand out. Yeah, I mean, he. I also think that Charles Wallace wanted to. Yeah, he knew that to survive. He needed to belong. He, but he needed also to wanted people get to along. appreciate him for what he was. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But notice, George never spent any time wondering why he wanted to belong. He just did. Which tells us from the outset, he's an oddball. Okay? Things were like that. You were in or you were out. In was a lot safer. That's the Charles Wallace example. Okay? He keeps getting beat up. Why? Because he's not in. It wasn't the sort of thing you question. It was just there. On the class trip before this one, they'd been to the war museum and learned all about trench warfare. George had thought that that's what life felt like. That's what life felt like. Trench warfare. What does this tell us about... George's experience of life at the ripe old age of 12. That's hell. Yeah, one of my ancestors said war is hell. Okay. George is kind of thinking life is hell. Keep your head below the parapet so you wouldn't get hit. He's 12. I can understand feeling this if he's 25, or 30, or 55, but 12? And it's, is it like George, you know, based upon what you know from the first 100 pages or so, is it like George really has an awful, horrible life? I mean, is he raised dirt poor? No. Does he have abusive parents? Well, his mom. Abusive. His well, mom's not abusive. She's not physically. She's neglectful, but she's not abusive. His father, he's dead. But he was a great guy. Okay. Seems like he was a good guy. Okay. Does George have friends? Yeah, kind of. Maybe a little bit at school, but they're not the in crowd. But his life's not that great. And we're told, of course, that was last year. In the past. Like all the other things about being a kid. He was a kid when he was 11. The narrator is telling us, George doesn't think of himself as a kid anymore at 12. He still thought about them, the other things about being a kid, but now he's 12, real 12. Not only 12, real 12. His 12, he knew his 12 wasn't anything like his dad's. Because he'd seen pictures of his dad as a kid, looking clueless and specky and fat. That is, he's got freckles and such. All of which, in George's notice, 12-year-old trench. The battle he's fighting would be the equivalent of sitting on top of the parapet with a big round target painted on your head saying, Hey, over here. In other words, hit me now. So what's the difference in George's mind between his dad being 12 and George being 12? Uh, his dad being 12 is like, this guy hasn't grown up at all. And George being 12 is like, I've seen some shit, so I know what life is like. Okay. His dad had what kind of 12-year-old childhood? Or what kind of childhood? Normal. Normal? Good? The average one. Fortunate? He could remember talking and laughing about stuff like this with his dad before his dad moved out. And then we get, he didn't say much at home anymore. 
He is not dead, he is George. His mother complained about it, usually to him, but sometimes to other people late at night on the phone when she thought he was asleep, which means George hears everything. He hears his mother talking about him. This is part of the thing that makes George feel like he's in the trench. Somewhere inside it hurt when he heard her talk about it. Not as much as when she said he used to have such a lovely smile, but nearly. Why did he have such a lovely smile, but not has? Because he doesn't smile anymore. And nowhere near as much as never being able to say anything to his dad ever again. Notice, that's the hardest thing. That's the thing that hurts the most. And we come to find out what George did say in his last words to his dad. And it wasn't nice. Okay. So we hear a little more about George. We get a little narration about him. Average height, maybe a little taller, but he feels shorter. The same way he sometimes felt older than he was. He looks at his reflection. Excuse me. Um, let me go on. Uh, yeah, they're off to the museum. And describe his teacher, Killing Beck. Nice last name. Nice last name. Jerk? Yeah. yeah, essentially hateful. Chapman. The rest of you, clear Chapman's mess up. Is it George Chapman's mess? Did George knock over the rack of pamphlets? No. Nope. No, it's the other guy. So Chapman says, George says, bottom of page seven, wasn't me. Who was it then? And what does George immediately realize? I'll never be accepted. I'll never be in if he does what? If he narks on a guy, okay? Sorry to use old phrase. <laughs> Moral cowardice and dumb insolence. Moral cowardice. It's moral cowardice not to tell on the person who turned the thing over, okay? So the teacher just goes on and on, and George is standing there, got his hands in his pockets. Get your hands out of your pockets, George does. And he tells George, you're going to stand here and you're going to say sorry if you have to stand here all day. George doesn't say sorry. He doesn't tell him who does it. Okay. Top of page nine. Or you can tell me who did it. Do you understand? In other words, there's your choice, George. Tell or stand here, stand still all day. Don't talk, don't eat, don't drink. Keep your hands out of your pockets, don't move. That's the rock. We're told, middle of the page. The hard place was less simple. Why? Because it was so big, so immovable. The hard place was everything else. The hard place was his life. You know the phrase, stuck between a rock and a hard place? What does it mean? You can't move. There's nothing you can do. Okay? The hard place is his life. There's George doesn't see what? There's no escape. It sucks. It sucked this morning, and it's going to suck tonight. It's going to suck tomorrow, and tomorrow morning, and tomorrow night, and the day after that, and every other day. It's never going to get better in George's mind. Ah, oh, there it is. George looked at the monkey's fangs. How easily they'd snap through that impatient stick of flesh and brittle bone. He'd like to have those teeth in his head. He's thinking of his teacher. He'd like to bite that finger off and spit it back at Killing Beck. That finger that's in George's face. He'd like it so much he could feel the crunch and crack and almost taste the blood. So, George says to Mr. Killing Beck, page 10, I understand that's what you think I should do, sir. That is, I should tell you who knocked it over. I just don't agree with it. Moral cowardice? No, George is showing moral courage here by telling his teacher, I think you're wrong. Okay, So, George is told, 
You have to stay outside while everybody else gets to go explore the Museum of Natural History. This is in London. Been there many times. And she's like, like hell. The teacher and the class leave, and so does George. The teacher and the class leave to go about their tour. George goes and steps outside the doors. The guard doesn't care whether or not George stays there. And he goes and he steps outside, and he leans up against the wall, probably just like I did without realizing that all over the facade, the side of the Museum of Natural History, there are these little carvings that stick out. Some of them are dragon's heads, like this one. Some of them are pterodactyls. Some of them are lizards, like sculptures built into the side of the wall. Better than this, you know, god-awful ugliness, or even the outside of Peck Hall. At least there's something to attract your attention there. And he leans against it, and it sticks in his back. Okay? Now he's mad. But let's go back for a moment to the beginning of the chapter. Chapter 2, the horror. So we begin with, in the belly of the whale, the monkey's teeth. Second paragraph. George knew it was safer and easier to be alone. Notice the first paragraph, the first chapter, it was about George doesn't wonder why he wants to get along. <laughs> but he knows here it's easier and safer to just be alone. He decided this right after his dad had died, when life had suddenly filled with too many people saying all the wrong things, as if their words could begin to fill the new dull hole in the middle of him. What are all the wrong things? Oh, it'll be okay, George. You'll get over it. Rain spat at him, thinking alone was the way to be. Why? Because alone meant you were in charge of what could get to you and what you could keep out. That's the thing I had written down on the quiz, and I said, you know, explain what this means. Notice what George is thinking there. If you're alone, you're in charge of what? of what could get to you. How wrong could George be? He thinks he's the captain of his destiny, the master of his fate, without realizing there's other pool balls, billiard balls, in this universe. He doesn't get to exist alone, because what happens when somebody else decides to play pool? The balls all move. Sometimes they hit you. And George thinks, and you could choose what to keep out. But he can't. He looks up and he sees the carvings. He feels the cold air. The carvings make him uneasy. It's like they're moving. But they're not moving. Not yet. They make him uneasy. He feels watched. He knew enough about self-pity to hate it. He looks at his watch. It's 3.42. Something jags into his back. That's that dragon head. He turns around. He looks at it. It reminds him of the things his dad made, used to make in his workshop. So what are we told about his father? Notice, we're not told explicitly. It's implied. He's a sculptor or carver. Right? Animal toys. He'd sometimes make out of clay to make George smile. The memory notice doesn't bring a smile to George's face. Instead, it makes him what? Angry. Hateful. How angry is he? He's angry. He's pissed with a capital P. How angry is he? This thing reminds him of his father, and what does he do? Punches it. He swings out with all his might, and he punches this thing. Because he wants to punch his father? No, he wants to punch the anger and the hatred that he has. He hated the carving. He hated it a lot. And notice, before he even thinks about it, fist is made, he swings and punches that thing. Why before he even thinks about it? It's just a reaction. Louder? 
You're not going to win a fight with Skull Shirt. A stone, especially. Because if you've ever punched anything hard, went through an angry period in my early 20s, you know, punching holes in dorm walls without rings, just, you know, really angry, <laughs> breaking things with my fist, etc. He's not thinking at all, because if he was thinking, he would think, if I swing and hit this concrete block wall with all my might, what's it going to do? That's it. The wall's going to win every time. Why? Not Hulk. You know, smash. You know, No. The wall's going to do the smashing. Once he thought about it, notice, while he's swinging, he knew this was going to hurt. He knew there'd be blood. Split knuckles. Maybe even broken bones. In other words, he's not just giving it a little tap. He knew he didn't mind. He knew in a place that was closer to wanting than knowing that all oh, this was likely and all oh, this was okay. Why? Because he knows he can't stop it. Okay. Why else? It's deeper than that. Okay. You almost said the word. You started to say it. You started to say the pain. He needs real, physical pain. Why? Because he has all of this emotional pain bottled up. And it's only by the relief of that physical pain that he's going to let it out and just scream bloody murder. His fist was the size of a dragon's head. Rock, <laughs> immovable force. Something's got to give. In the microsecond before impact, he realized he didn't know what this would feel like. He realized he was going to break his first bone. He felt more air on his gums as his grin ricked his wider. In other words, his face is going, because he realizes this is going to hurt like holy hell. He doesn't feel the impact. He hurts it. He heard it. Hurts. He heard it. Sharp, ugly crack, and the world jerked a bit. Why? Because he pulled his fist back and went, mm. no. What just happened? Everything. <laughs> the world jerked a bit means everything changes. George just realized, excuse me, George just entered Oz for all intents and purposes. He left the London he knew behind the moment he hit that stone. He doesn't know why. It takes him a long time to learn why. He closes his hands, he cradle, closes his eyes, cradles his hand, notice instinctively why. He's waiting for the wave of pain. Waiting means what? Hasn't come. I'll be the first to tell you. You swing and hit that concrete wall as hard as you can, that pain, it's instantaneous. It, you don't need to sit there and go, huh, something wrong with my nerves. It hasn't, no, it's. It doesn't really apply in this situation, but like I know like in the UFC and everything, like if you know, you're fighting and there's all the adrenaline going, like they'll break a bone and sure. they don't notice it. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that sometimes happens. That's a it's a very different circumstance because the the adrenaline is already all pumped up. See, George doesn't have any adrenaline already pumped up. It's like you know when I used to play soccer. I mean, you play soccer, guys would get fractures and not be aware of it. Football, uh, Cowboys quarterback played through a torn ACL. You know. I've had multiple knee surgeries. I haven't had ACL, but, you know, bad enough. But to play through a torn ACL, which means your knee kind of just wants to flop all around. That's excruciating. He doesn't look at his hand. But he hears something. Something hisses at him. He opens his eyes. He must have imagined it. As he turned to check behind him, his foot stumbled over and it's dark. He looks down. Oh, it's the dragon head. He knocked 
the stone carving off the wall. He looks at the portico, the entry, entry part of the building, and there's the neck. Looks like a scalpel took it off. Now, is that how something like that would normally break? A nice, smooth, clean cut? You, you have a, a hand sticking off a wall, and you take the hammer and hit it? It's not going to be a nice, clean, smooth, straight cut. It's going to be jagged. Not this one. He looks at his hand. No blood. No bone, wet from the rain, doesn't even hurt. Picks up the dragon's head. Something had changed. It wasn't looking at him anymore. It wasn't looking at anything. Unless he was going mad, it had been looking at him. Now, its eyes were closed. Before he hit it, the eyes were open. Well, how would knocking the stone sculpture off a wall suddenly make it look as though the stone sculpture has changed? Gotta be the lighting. He hears another hiss, a wet scrape and a dry squeal. And he turns around and he thinks it's gotta be the museum guards. Killing Beck set him on. Turk puts the jack dragon's head into his coat pocket, thinks I'm in trouble. And then he hears that strange sound again. Not anything human, it's not anything possible. And he looks at the wall and he says, huh? It's a pterodactyl and it's moving and it's moving towards him. Eyes wide, unblinking, body small, surprisingly pigeon chested, and it's crawling towards him. And George's body had entirely forgotten to breathe. Why? He's thinking what in the world? He hears more noises. It looked right at him with dead stone eyes, and they're locking on him. And George finally decides, run. <laughs> and so he runs. Exhibition Road is the road that the Museum of Natural History is on. That's on one side of the road. As you're heading south, the Museum of Natural History is on the right side. The Victoria and Albert Museum is on the left side of the road. Okay. He's not heading south. He's heading north. So the museum's on his left side. And he runs. And he runs and runs and runs and runs. And he thinks to himself, page 20, running from nightmares is how nightmares begin. Our bodies have really old memories that our minds know nothing about. And he runs and he runs and he gets to the bottom of Kensington Gardens, another road. And he hangs a right, if I remember right there. He can't see how to get into the park, that is Kensington Gardens Park, which is on the other side of the road. So he turns and runs. Okay. He sees a tramp, runs into the tramp. Tramp lets him go. Pterodactyl steps out from behind a tree. Scuttles behind another tree. In other words, the pterodactyl looks like it's trying to keep hidden from people, but it's not. It's trying to do what? Sneak up on George. George, did you see it? Trying to get the right amount of oxygen into his body as he grasped at the receding wisp of his normal world. He thinks, I'm going crazy. The tramp shrugs. But the tramp does say, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they ain't after you, right? There's movement closer to George, and he sees another pterodactyl, about eight feet long. He keeps running. Now he's running. Okay, so he's gone up. Here's Exhibition Road. Here's uh, the Museum of Natural History. Here's the V&A. He runs up this way. He gets to Exhibition Road. Excuse me, he gets the Kensington Gardens Road, which is like this. The gardens are over here. He keeps running this way. The gardens lead into what's called Hyde Park. It's one of the largest parks in London. Hyde Park has a road that comes over here, and then there's another road up here, and it comes around like this and leads over to this. It's the Hyde Park corner. And he's going to come to a statue over here. 
All the statues that are mentioned in this book are all real. Every single one of them. In the locations that they're in. Okay? This is one of the things I find so fascinating about this. You know, Because when I first read this, I was like, whoa, 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 I've been there. I've seen that statue, the gunner, the whole nine yards. And the gunner is actually made by a guy named Jagger. Okay? And there's a bunch of Jaggers all throughout London. So, he runs, runs past the street cleaner, etc. And we get to chapter four, the, gor the gunner. He goes to Hyde Park Corner, busiest junction in London, we're told. Okay? And if you were there, right over here, not very far away, there's a, another big street over here, you have which is going to be mentioned at one point. You've got Green Park. Down here you have, we pronounce it Paul Mall, they pronounce it Pal Mal. Okay. And right here is Buckingham Palace. And then over here is St. James Park. Okay. So, George runs off. He gets over here to Hyde Park Corner, and he gets to the War Artillery Memorial. The Royal Artillery War Memorial on page 26. Backs up to it. He's looking at these pterodactyls, stalking him. And we're told at the bottom of that page, he backed up until he was stopped by 70 tons of white Portland stone. Think of it like granite. It's not granite, but he looked around for a moment, thought the pterodactyl was impossibly hanging above his head, ready to drop on him. And he's, I mean, he's just kind of right up against the monument. And he hears the noises in front of him. Bottom of 27. George had run out of ideas. The pterodactyl turned to look at him slowly, easily, hatefully. And the hate in its eyes was an old hate. A hate that George didn't understand, but felt right in its core. And on top of the hate was cruelty and glee. Because George is thinking, this pterodactyl knows you're mine. You can't go anywhere now. He stands there, nowhere to run, nothing but fear, we're told, and the wall at his back. His mouth made shapes. We don't know what shapes and sound they made, but finally, George just says, please. It's his form of help. <laughs> the monster opens its beak, reared back for what George knew was a killing blow. Please, George says again. Bam! Blam! Blam! Crash! Something lands in front of George. Something with steel tacks on its boots. Something with a gun. Someone. Three more shots. George looks up. He sees a man made from tarnished bronze from the bottom of his army boots to the top of his tin helmet. The gunner from the war memorial. Look down at him. At him. Breaks his revolver open, takes out the spent shells, and reloads. George felt his nightmare wasn't over. Really? Because now not only does he have stone pterodactyls chasing him, but now bronze statues are coming alive. And with guns. With guns, even. George looks at, we're told, the three salamanders move across or towards him. And he looks and he sees the ancient hatred in three pairs of eyes, top of page 30. They hiss and lash their tails, and the gunner, blah, 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 you know, takes care of them. Notice two shots each salamander. Takes off his hat, drops it into George's arms, wipes his forehead. Fumbles with the ammo pouch at his belt. Reloads. Gunner comes back to George. Page 34. Excuse me, 31. 
lights a cigarette. Thanks, George says. Gunner looks at him. George is like, I, I, need, I need to say something else. And all he says is, um. And the gunner says, we're told, with a gravelly voice, a cockney voice, thank me when this is over, mate. George. What? The gunner takes another puff, blew it out on a half laugh. Blimey. You got no idea what you just started, have you? George is like, Deep in the city, something had been woken, something so old and so ordinary that people had been walking past it for centuries without giving it a second look. Okay? And when you get a description of this thing, it's a piece of stone, it's a block of stone, hidden in a hole in a wall in a building covered over with a wire grate. Okay? Only what happens? A bag of barbecue chips, the empty bag, has blown in and landed on this thing, and it just what? Burst into flames. Okay. And now George starts to shake. Why? Pterodactyl dead. Salamander's dead. Living, breathing, talking metal man statue. Not dead. And so the gunner says to George, or George talks to the gunner. And he says, what's that? That's the quadrigan. And he says, no, not that. That, he hears a whistle. Oh, it's a warning. About what? Not the time for question, son. Time for a choice. Stay or go. That is, stay here or run. George, I don't know what's happening. Yeah, you do. <laughs> You're choosing. Stay or go. George, that's ridiculous. Because it's not just stay or go, it's live or die. Live, go, stay, die. It's ridiculous. George is like, what? Of course it's ridiculous, the gunner says. Death's always ridiculous. What does he mean? Never makes sense. So what? Life's a joke and all. That's why you might as well have a laugh and enjoy it while you're here. But it's your show, and it's your, it's your life. Son, which way are you going to jump? George is thinking, what? I'm 12 years old. I shouldn't have to deal with this. Kind of like Charles Wallace, you know. Why do I have to solve the problem of mad dog, you know, Brenzillo and such? So the gunner says, all right, fine. You sit there and think. I'm getting back up that plant, and I'll watch what that thing, what the thing that's on the way here does to you. Because if you're too stupid to save yourself, you're too stupid to bother about. No, help me. God helps them what help themselves. What does that mean? It means hold my hand and run like a bastard. In other words... I'm helping you. So they run. Okay? And they run and they run and they run and they run. And who sees them running? Another person, a girl on the top of a red double decker bus, one of the sightseeing buses, sees George and what? A metal man. So. They pull into a parking garage, which there's called a car park, and it's actually, it's like uh, over here, and it's literally underground. It's not built above the ground. It's all, you go in, and you've got multiple levels down below. I don't remember how deep this is. It's like 100 feet, okay? And he finally gets George's attention. They get down there. And the gunner lights another cigarette. Okay, when's the gunner from? World War One. World War One. Okay. What kind of laws are there against smoking in World War One? None. Or in the nineteen teens? None at all. Everybody. Okay. 
Smokes inside, outside, etc. When was this written? This was written in yeah, 2006. Published in 2006. This was after Britain banned smoking inside, anywhere, essentially. Okay. So, page 45, the gunner says, you need to pay attention, son, because whatever you woke up thinking were the rules, well, up still up and down still down, but everything in between, all bets are off. Whole new ball of chalk. What do you mean? You want to survive this? You need to think first and ask the right questions. What do you mean, ain't the right question? George starts to shake again. Notice, the gunner says, that's good. That's good. The brain, engage the brain. Why? You're feeling shocked. That's good. That means you're starting to accept the reality. It'll pass or you'll go doolily for a bit. I don't want to go doolily. It might not be the worst. Okay? George, tell me what's happening. Tell me what you are. Tell me what those things are. I'm a statue. Duh. <laughs> Their statues, that is, pterodactyl, the salamanders, carvings, whatever, that's what they have in common. They're all statues. He says, I'm a spit, they're taints. What's the difference? Taints hate spits. All right? Spits don't care much for taints because of it. You could say there's a zip between us since the first man thought of carving something and putting a little of himself into it. He says, See, we're both made, both created by craftsmen or artists. Don't matter which, we call them both makers. We, spits and taints, call the people that make us makers. But we're as different as chalk from cheese. George, taints are evil? Because he's thinking, that they wanted to eat me, therefore it's, you know, it's evil. Don't know about evil, they're just bad, see? Why? Difference between spits and taints? Spits, there's nothing human in them. They was made to frighten, to be ugly, to leer at you off church roofs, and put the shivers up you. George, gargoyles? Yeah. Those are spits. I mean, excuse me, taints. I mean, all gargoyles is taints, but not all taints are gargoyles. What else can taints be? What other forms can they take? Okay. Pterodactyls, salamanders, are salamanders in and of themselves evil? The, the little slimy amphibians? No. Okay. But there's nothing human about them. So he says, things like gargoyles was made to remind you about hell, meant to outshout the devil. Nothing human in them. Empty. And like all empty things, think the ekthroi. What? They're hungry. Not for food. They're hungry for what makes you, you, and me, me. Well, what makes George, George, and the gunner, the gunner? The human. The image that they bear. Okay? George. Huh? The gunner. Though, of course, I'm less me than you're you, me being a spit and all. What's he mean? He says, I'm an image of a human. You're a real human. A spit is a statue that the maker, sculptor, stone carver, whatever, has made to represent someone human. Okay? We don't have any quote unquote spits on campus, I don't believe. We've got that god awful ugly thing over out in front of. There's the statues uh, of the guys who are like baseball teams, or football teams. Baseball teams. No, see, I'm never over there, so I wasn't even aware of that. Um, yeah, and you've got, you know, relief carvings on plaques and things like that. He says, and because of that, because this spit is a statue made to represent someone, while a maker works, something of that must flow into us and fills that hole the taints have eating away inside them. So, I mean, the statue of Lord Kitchener ain't Lord Kitchener, right? British politician. But he's what the artist thought and knew about Lord Kitchener. Similarly, you could pull out your this thing and say, yeah, it looks like me, but that ain't me. And for some of us, it doesn't even look like us. You know, 
driver's license photo. He says, but it's what the artist thought and knew about Lord Kitchener. It's like he's got a spark of Kitchener's spirit in him. He's the spirit in image, thus the spit of Lord Kitchener. You get it? Make sense? George is trying to understand. So who are you? That is, you're not a real individual person. I'm the gunner. No one special. In other words, he's the image of what? A gunner from the Great War. Yeah. Just your average gunner grunt from World War I. Just a soldier from the Great War. Only other name I got is the name of the man what made me. Just like you got the name of the man what made you. Whatever your name is, uh, Chapman, George Chapman, I'm Jagger. My maker was Charles Sergeant Jagger. So I'm a Jagger. You got a big family? No. It's just George, right? Because it's bomb now. Gunner, I got a few. Jagger's all over London. Jagger did well out of the war. People liked what he'd done, making us look like heroes. Nothing crowing about it. Made us look like men who knew about mud and dying first. Then made us look like heroes after. In other words, he made them look like what they were. People who died in a war. For them that had lost sons and husbands, we looked like the men they wanted to remember them as the men they hoped they'd become before the bloody general sent them out to be butchered. So what the, the gunner has just said, or what he's implied, is that for himself, as example, he bears that image, that ideal of the gunner, that person who would sacrifice himself for others. Next chapter, we see Edie trying to capture, find them. She comes in. George tells her to go away. The gunner tells her to go away. And they find out, you know, they've been followed by something. Chapter 9. They're getting ready to leave the car park. And there's a guy in a Mercedes. George, why can't he see me? Page 58. Oh, well, he can see you. His, his eyes work, but he can't see you in his head. What do you mean? His brain won't let him. George, because? Because he's a normal, rational bloke. Apart from driving a German car. And normal, rational people don't believe you can walk around London with statues. Why not? Because statues don't walk around London. Stands to reason, that is, the rational mind says, it's impossible. So if it's impossible, what does the rational mind do? Shut it out. It shuts out the thing that's impossible. So his mind won't believe his eyes. It's a protection thing. If he could see us, he'd know he was, you know, Delali. Mm-hmm. That's right. You know he's going crazy. Why can I see? In other words, George is thinking, am I going crazy? Is this all just part of my descent into madness? Because you've done something. Don't know what, but it must have been bad to get the taint so angry. Suppose we'll have to find out what it was. But I'll tell you this. It was bad enough to drop you out of your London into my London. And that's not good. Not for you. What do you mean, your London? The London where the taints ate the spits. In other words, in the gunner's London, taints and spits are what? They're at war, and they're alive. Right? And things that stay still in your London move and hunt and fight. Now, you got to understand, London... A lot of carvings. I mean, you can't walk a street without seeing a statue or a carving of some kind. 
So some of them are big, massive. So is this, is he basically telling me that, like, there's a, like, almost like a, another dimension where they're, they are, like, the statues are fighting in this, this world where we can't see them fighting. But they're at it all the time, or is it just like wake them up and they're now? No, they're they're it's not that they're always fighting, like you know, sunlight sunlight comes and the dragons or the statues all jump off their plinths and go at it and then they you know get back at night. It's not that kind of thing. It's that they are always in conflict and sometimes it's open warfare and sometimes it's not. But we don't see it. Why? Because it doesn't make any sense. To our rational minds, it would it would do what to somebody to see something like this happen? Make them go crazy. Yeah, you would you would think you're you're literally crazy. Okay, so because it would make us think we're crazy, our minds don't allow us to process. It's an interesting little idea that Fletcher has done here because he's kind of suggesting, hmm, how do you know it's not really happening? Okay, it's another London, as it were. If we had read, we didn't have time. If we had read Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere, well, he introduces the reader to another London, a London beneath London, okay, based upon, built upon all the tunnels in the London Underground, not even half of which are open today. I mean, there's probably hundreds of tunnels that are closed. Some of these um, entrances you can walk by today and see they've got the gates drawn closed and the doors locked closed. And you can walk by them. You can still see the name of the entrance okay, to that station, but you can't get in. So it's, it's kind of an un-London. So he explains, didn't think your London was the only one, did you? London town's more than just any old city. It's like the rock and the clay, excuse me, and the dirt it sits on. It's got layers. You just fell through one into another. Now, come on, we got to go ask the sphinxes how we can best solve it. They think they hear something, and it's Edie. Edie says, I followed you. I've seen lots of statues move. And the gunner immediately knows something about her. Page 63. Edie says um, to the gunner, why isn't he like me? He can see you. He's just like me. He's, no one's like you. No one's like you. No one's been like you for years. I ain't seen or heard of anyone like you for more than years. For decades. No one has. Some of us even think you're Extinct. Well, they can't be extinct if she's still there. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not gone. I'm here. I'm a, you're a glint. A what? A glint. You're a glint. She looks at George. George is like, I don't know what Joey's talking about. What's a glint? Edie doesn't know what a glint is. Or, put it this way, she doesn't know the meaning of the word. Okay? She's never heard the word. A glint is what you are if you can see all this. Well, George can see all that, but he's not a glint. A glint. You're a glint, a seer, a bright spark. Someone so sharp and shiny they cut themselves. Shows so sharp, they slice between all the different layers of what is and what might be and end up chopping right on through into the what was. Flicker of something like panic in Edie's eyes. Why? What does he just describe? You can slice through the what is, what might be, and what was. What do glints do? Look back in time and see what through damage uh, stone. It's not necessarily damaged stone. It's any stone. She can touch any carving and experience time as it passed by that carving, from when that carving was first made. So she could, for example, she could go to Mount Rushmore. She could touch George Washington's head, and she could feel, she could experience everything that happened from
from the carving of Mount Rushmore at Mount Rushmore to today, okay? Or she could go to, she could go to a Confederate monument someplace that's been torn down. And she could experience everything from the time that Confederate monument was raised until it was torn down, okay? But she can also go forward. I don't know what that means, Edie says. I'm just me. Glint's is dangerous. Glint's is trouble. Glint's is so much bleeding trouble, they attract more trouble. A glint is the last thing we need if we want to get where we need to go. So you stay here. Okay. They talk about her warning stone. She says the gargoyle flew away because of her warning stone. Bottom of 65. The gunner says it flew away because it's a gargoyle. It's what a gargoyle is. She thinks it flew away because of her warning stone. The gunner's trying to get them to understand why did the gargoyle fly away? Because what has it started raining. doing? It started raining. Every gargoyle, well, almost every gargoyle that you will see if you go to a building in, in London or Europe, you know, a church or something that has gargoyles, they're usually, they usually serve a very specific function. They're water spouts. Water rushes down the roof. Goes down the gutter and is released out through the gargoyle's mouth. Okay. Some of the ruder ones, it's released out through another part of the gargoyle. I've actually seen some of those. It's just a jumped up water spout, he says. A really ugly, bad tempered water spout. What? That's its purpose. It is made to be a water spout. So when it starts to rain, what does the gargoyle have to do? Go back to its place. Fulfill its purpose, the reason for which it was made. When it isn't raining, it can go wherever it wants. Okay? It can't deny its first purpose. It's got to do what the maker intended, George Coffs. You mean God? God had a purpose for the gargoyle? Gunner laughs. Don't know anything about God's. A maker's just the bloke what makes us. Told you. Mine's Jagger. Makers make the maid. Okay, bear in mind, what were we told about George's father? He made things. He made things. Including George. With George's mother, obviously, he didn't make him on his own, you know. Makers make the maid, and the maid must follow their maker's meaning. That is, the things made have got to do what they are intended to do. Well, what's the gunner intended to do? Just stand there. No. Be a hero. He's a protector. He's a warrior. He's intended to be a warrior, okay? It's how it goes. It's how it's always gone. Your glass didn't save you, so don't try it again. Rain stopped it, or it didn't have you. Now we'll be going. So they leave, and the gunner says, Glintz is uncanny. What does uncanny mean? You can't figure it out. It's irrational. Well, Walking around with a bronze man is also a little bit irrational. And what we got to do is going to take all the canniness, that is, all the thought, all the wits I can muster. Glintz is bad luck. Okay. Edie says, I'm just going to follow you. George wants to go with the gunner, but something made him feel bad about leaving this girl. Maybe he was feeling sorry for her, he thought. Maybe he was feeling sorry for himself. Or maybe he just wanted company in his nightmare. Okay. What was he thinking at the beginning of the book? That he wanted to be alone. Why? Because being alone means what? He's master of his own. Yeah, you control things. Well, what did being alone lead him to? 
Now he's being chased by, you know, stone carving monsters. So they run off, and Edie follows. And we're told, page 72, she follows along. She sees him. Jack is too big for him and stuff. And we're told she remembered the look on his face as he said sorry. It had been an honest face. face. And he'd looked her right in the eye as he said it. And others, he didn't go, oh, sorry. He meant it. He seemed kind underneath the sadness and fear, which is why she'd hit him. What kind of life has Edie had compared to George's? Well, George is like heaven. Yeah, George has got a May. I mean, one, he has a home, a real home. He has a mother. We're going to meet Edie's mother in the third book. Okay. So we go to chapter 12, The Riddle of the Sphinxes. These are pretty cool, these um, statues down on the north bank of the Thames River. So George is talking with the gunner, page 78. And he asks, so, so all you do when you, when you kill a, a tank is you blow them to smithereens and that's it? The gunner, you don't kill all statues like that. Not spits anyway. But you kill a tank, they do go to pieces. Wind or something takes them, winnows them off. I mean, they're gone from the walking world. They do end up reconstituted back on their perch or their plinth after turn of day, but they never walk again. Turn of day is midnight. So that pterodactyl that he shot, the three salamanders, they will end up the next morning back on the facade of the National History Museum, but they'll never move again. They're dead. Spits are different, George asks. Chalk and cheese, mate. We don't go to pieces like taints do. Why? It's like we got more to hold us together. What's the more? The spirit part. At least that's how I see it. It's like a sense of who we are is just enough glue to stop us getting blown away like a tank. Why? Because if something happens to them, what does he say? If we get back in our plant or whatever before turn of day, we get better. Blow the gunner's head off. And take the gunner's body, if somebody takes the gunner's body and gets it back on his plank by midnight, same day, next day, heads back. As if he'd never been harmed. It's like we wake up next day, mended, recharged, like a, a George says electric toothbrush and he doesn't get it. All right. So they make their way down to the Sphinxes. And page 79, the gunner says, when he mentions the street they're on, Adam Street, it's a good omen if you believe in them. George, not really sure what to believe in after today. Well, believe in good luck then. Got to be good luck coming to the Sphinxes down Adam Street. Adam being the first man and all. Adam being the first man and all. How is Adam created? He was created by God in his image. Created by God in his image. God blew the breath of life into Adam and he became a living being. He wasn't created how though? Bad. He was created good. So that's what he means by, I think, when he says, it's got to be a good omen. I mean, here we are walking down Adam Street, first man and all that, and here you are, kind of like the first person who's ever been awakened into this world. I mean, this is man's business you're on now, youngin. Good sign. So good sign, don't do any harm. He says, there they are, and there's the sphinx sphinxes. What are sphinxes? Half man, half lion. Half woman, half lion. Okay? 
In other words, part taint, part spit. Page 81. The gunner says to him, stay away. I won't harm you. I'm a spit. Them sphinxes. There's something in between. Half taint, half spit. Get on the wrong side of them. Could go either way. Because they're half spit, half taint that we're talking to them. If you've stirred up the taints, they'll know what's to be done. If anything's to be done. Okay? Edie shows up. And Edie gives them her name. And the Sphinx says, the one Sphinx says, who is she? And the other one, she's a glint. Notice, the one that says she's a glint, hissed. Where else have we seen hissing? With the pterodactyl. The first Sphinx purrs. Why did you bring a glint? We thought there were no more glints. We thought the gift had died out. She, not with us, you know. Okay. So, they're told, or they tell the Sphinx, we have a question. Well, everyone has a question. That's why they come to us, page 84. The boy's done something to stir up the taints. So what? How can we stop them? Killing, the, killing him? Gunner, yeah, that'd be your first start. So that's your question? Gunner looks at George. George nods. You sure? You sure that's the question you want answered? So George says, how can I stop these things killing me? Okay. So they give him a riddle. Why? Because that's what sphinxes do. Oedipus. 87. I am a suit no man may no man may wear, neither peasants nor kings, yet no man goes without me. What's got by me shall be well known. What lies at me is the reason for things. All may touch me when I am soft, none when I am stone. Lose me and you will falter, yet if I am taken, you will find courage anew. And we find out, George figures it out, it's the answer is heart. Okay. I am a suit no man may wear. Neither peasants nor kings, yet no man goes without me. It's not something you can put on, but you have to have a heart in order to move. What's got me, got by me, if you learn something by heart, it's well known. What lies at me, at the heart of things, is the reason for things. A soft heart versus a stony heart. And lose me and you will falter, yet if I am taken, take heart and you will have new courage. Okay? So, George tells them the answer is heart, and we get page 91. You want to know how to stop the Tates killing you? Yes. Your remedy lies in the stone heart, and the heart stone shall be your relief. Stone heart, heart stone. To end what has begun, you must first find the stone heart. And then you must make sacrifice and amends for that which was broken. By placing on the stone at the heart of London that which is necessary for its repair. And the gunner asks a question. Excuse me, George asks the gunner, what's the stone heart? Gunner has no idea. What's the stone heart? He asks the Sphinx. He already got his one question. We answered your question. Maybe you should have asked a better one. George, that's not fair. We're not fair. We're sphinxes. That is, we don't live by human morality. You cheated. We answered your question, but you didn't answer mine. There it was, the gravelly little voice. There's Edie. Okay. So, notice Edie is much more circumspect with them. She knows to be careful with how she speaks to them. They say to her, page 93, because of that, you have a very suspicious mind, little girl. Thank you. That's not meant to be praise. Okay? She takes it as praise. Okay? So, let's 
to. They ask Edie how they are different, and she says, well, one of you has holes and the other one doesn't. How did we become different? And what does Edie do? She glints, okay? And she experiences what? Bombings of London. Bombing of London. Page 99. The closest Sphinx stopped and looked at her. How can you not know what you are? Everything knows what it is. I thought you answered questions, not asked them. A bomb put holes in the one of you that's damaged, right? You answer my question. You want to know why glints can make stones weep? No. Edie pushed the gunner aside. It's my question. The gunner, but answer my question. Okay. So page 100. Let's see here. So the Sphinx has holes in it. Uh, one of them does. So yeah, the, one of them has holes in it. And earlier it was talking about the, uh, the Sphinx can be charged by anything. Like, the, the if they're, holes. Yeah, if they're put back on their plant before midnight, then they will be essentially repaired. Is the Sphinx because it's not as like as good as that tank? Is that why? Can That's exactly fun? why. Okay. Yep. Because the body of the Sphinx is the body of a lion, and that's the body. In, in, the description is is entirely accurate. It's from World War Two. Okay. Um, and the Sphinx has holes in it from shrapnel, just as you know if you. If you go up Exhibition Road and you walk by the Vic, um, Victoria and Albert Museum and you go by the National History Museum, there's um, pockmarks all over the walls because of the bombing of London during the Blitz, during 1941. They didn't repair that. They intentionally did not repair it. They left it, you know, with the, the damage in the walls. Not where there are actual holes in the walls, but pockmarks in it. Right. So the Sphinx talks to Edie and the gunner and, and George and says, you are here. I can see that because Edie's like, you know, I'm still here, still waiting. But to know what a glint is, to truly comprehend, you must see things on a longer scale. And on a longer scale, you, him, all people are scarcely here at all. Compared to the life of stone or metal, you are as important as a splash of rain that falls in a summer shower and then dries out and is gone. Okay, now keep in mind who is speaking. Not really a spit, but not really a taint. More taint than spit, however. What people do passes, but the rocks remain. Not forever, just a lot longer than people. And the rocks remember. Right? I mean, we live 70 years, 80, maybe 90 if we're lucky. Stone lasts hundreds, thousands, some of it billions of years. Okay? That doesn't make sense. How can rocks remember? Glints bring the spark of what happened out of the rock. George, you see the past. I don't. I mean, it's, it's more than that, this week says. You do see the past. When it's happening, when you did that thing, when everything went, you know, sickening, like you've been kicked in the stomach, when your hair stood on end, she goes, I don't know what you're talking, I don't know what thing I do. I wasn't there, I was, I was the Sphinx. She was then. Bad things that happen leave a mark on their surroundings. Good things too, but people react more strongly to bad. And glints, when they touch stones that have a mark in them, channel it. Past plays through them again. So, George, when George says, when it's happening, when you did that thing, when everything went, you know, sickening, like you've been kicked in the stomach, when your hair stood on end, George is kind of saying, you know, we experienced a little bit of it, but he experienced what? All of it. 
like she'd gotten into Doctor Who's TARDIS and went back to the actual bombing. Okay? George, that's amazing. What's George thinking? Hmm. Maybe I can go back and talk to Dad. <laughs> Edie, it's terrible. Gunner says it's a waste. So the Sphinx finally tells them, ask the Shaveling. George, I don't know what a Shaveling is. Gunner doesn't know what a Shaveling is. All right. Page 105. Edie swiveled her eyes without moving her face, and George, caught in the flatness of her gaze, knew exactly what it was about her that perturbed the gunner. Her eyes, when they were like this, were not particularly human. Or if they were human, they seemed so old that no human could have lived long enough to own them. They were eyes that had gone elsewhere and seen awful things and come back different. He realized that the flatness of her gaze was not dullness. It was as if her eyes were worn or bleached out by too much weather. Meaning, Edie's what? She's seen more than anybody should be required to see. It's kind of like there's a reason we live 70 years. You know, as opposed to, take the Old Testament figure of Methuselah. If you, if you take that the Bible is true. Methuselah, according to the book of Genesis, lived 969 years. He was still having kids, I think, when he was 600. 600! Take 600 from now. 1417. Okay. Henry V had just defeated the French at Agincourt in 1415. Go 600 years before that, and you're in, you know, 800s. Okay, so you're, you're talking really long lifespan. What would you experience? Let's say you were born in 1417, and you turned 600 today. Well, you'd experience an awful lot, or some at least, of the wars of the Hundred Years' War, okay, the Protestant Reformation, the Thirty Years' War, the American Revolutionary War, all the wars in Europe, whether or not you were physically at each of these places, the Spanish Inquisition, the horrors of the 20th century, you know, in terms of World War I, World War II, communism, etc. Think of the wear on the human psyche. That's what Edie has experienced. Because she touches things, she goes back into time and experiences those things. And there's a lot of stuff in London she could touch that could take her way back. I mean, in a moment, they're going to be in a place that's less than a mile from parts of the Roman walls of London. So she could touch those walls, the actual walls. I take my students every summer, every other summer when I teach my Harry Potter course in London. We go on a walking tour, and I take them there so they can go up and touch a piece of wall that's 2,000 years old because it's not blocked off. She could touch that, and what would she experience? 2,000 years of shit. <laughs> well, she'd experience what occurred 2,000 years ago, okay, with the Romans fighting the Britons. There's other places she could experience the English Civil Wars, etc. She could go to Stonehenge and go back to 3500 BC in time and experience what? Probably human sacrifice, okay? That's not necessarily a great blessing to have. We'll pick up, because it's almost time. We'll pick up with um, chapter 14. We'll finish this on Thursday simply because we have to. So we can start the next one next Tuesday.